I'm Linda Reed, and I'd like to read from our latest book, our Sammy Green thriller, Deep Waters. For over 30 minutes, Ollie had filmed the divers combing through the shelf's soft bottom for artifacts and debris from the sunken ship. The strong currents had slowed their progress, but they'd managed to collect several netfuls of broken pottery. Unfortunately, tedious scenes of divers hunting for vases were hardly likely to get decent airplay on the network especially after video of the wreck itself from the sonar-guided remote explorer had already aired to much fanfare. With only one day allotted to his shoot, it would be up to Sammy to find a way to punch up the interest level for the B-roll he'd recorded. Otherwise, their piece would end up as weekend filler on a slow news day. Ollie checked his gauges, satisfied that he could remain at 20 meters for another 10 minutes before beginning his rise to the surface. Let the diving team do their job. He needed to do his. Get film segments that would pop off the screen. He signaled one of the team with a thumbs up, indicating he was about to start his ascent, then turned in the opposite direction away from the mooring line, aiming towards the direction of the shipwreck. A few more shots would spice up his stock. The siren call of Amphitrite, Poseidon's beautiful wife from the murky depths, was too tempting to resist. Struggling to hold his camera steady, Ollie let the swift current carry him closer to the edge of the shelf. As he neared the drop-off, he was battered by a rush of ice-cold flow, which threw him back onto the shelf's sea floor. Christ, he thought, downwelling. One of his worst nightmares, he'd only encountered it once before, a dive off Sydney years ago when he was younger and fitter. He'd spilled off the Great Barrier Reef, riding helpless down an underwater waterfall deeper towards the bottom. Ollie scoured his memory for the steps to recover. Buffeted again and again by the water's force, he fought to ascend against the current. He knew he was using precious air, but he had no choice. With excruciating slowness, he inched his way back to the mooring line. Just as he grabbed hold of it again, one of his fins got caught in a protruding bronze strut. He bent to dislodge it with the same hand that held his camera when he noticed something embedded in a small rock nearby, its visibility hampered by the current stirring of the silt. Closer inspection suggested it too was made of some kind of metal, bronze. Aiming his camera, he adjusted the lens until a three inch wheel came into clear focus. There was writing on it, ancient Greek. This could be something significant. Excited, Ollie clipped the camera to the D-ring on his BC, let go of the rope using his wedged fin as leverage, and scooped up the rock with both hands. His fingers clutched the wheel and gently lifted it from the silt. Ollie saw that a toothed gear had adhered to the wheel's back. The thin, rusted metal from both pieces reflected the light from the, his torch into his eyes, momentarily blinding him. He quickly stashed his find in his vest pocket, then felt a tug behind him a trail of bubbles. Ollie swiveled to see one of the dive team hovering. He barely registered the names and faces of the team members when he'd been introduced yesterday. But in any case, the tight-fitting masks they all wore distorted their features, making identification of his companion difficult. An extra pair of hands was very welcome to help him extricate his trapped fin so he could head back up to the ship. Ollie couldn't wait to show Sammy and the team the treasure he'd discovered. With only minutes of bottom time remaining, Ollie grabbed the rope and gestured at his jammed fin. To his surprise, the diver made no move to help, but continued to float beyond arm's length above. His anxiety growing, Ollie tried a distress signal, waving his hand quickly over his head. Still no reaction from the diver. He struggled to free himself from the strut. Couldn't the bloody fool see he was in trouble? Frustrated but aware that he needed to hurry, Ollie turned away to focus on his predicament. Hyperventilating with the effort, he knew he was expending his air supply too quickly, yet didn't dare release the mooring line to use both hands. The strong downwelling could push him farther toward the bottom, making it impossible to return to the surface in time. He forced himself not to panic. There! He'd managed to unclip the fin from his boot. Giddy with relief, he inhaled one deep breath before checking the gauge on his air tank. Bloody hell, less than 100 PSI of compressed air remained. He'd used up too much trying to get free. He lifted his head. Even at 70 feet down, he could see rays of sun angling down from the shimmering surface. 
The trip up with appropriate safety stops to decompress should take four to nine minutes. With little reserve in the tank, Ollie no longer had the luxury of making a slow ascent. Unless, desperate, he twisted to face the diver who still hovered nearby, his hands tucked in his weight belt like a nonchalant American gunslinger. Simulating a throat slitting motion, Ollie made the universal sign signifying that he was nearly out of air and with it an appeal to share the diver's oxygen. For a moment, the diver seemed to back off, then, as if reconsidering, swam hurriedly toward him. Grateful and hungry for air, Ollie reached out for the diver's spare regulator, only to have his own hose ripped from his lips. What the hell? Ollie sucked in a mouthful of seawater and lost his grip on the mooring line. Choking and disoriented, he was in no position to fight when the diver reached into his vest pocket, grabbed the wheel and gear, and unbuckled his weight belt, launching him towards the surface like a projectile. In his final moments of consciousness, Ollie suspected that someone must have tampered with his BC vest, but he never had time to wonder why. Deep Waters by Deborah Schlein and Linda Reed.